This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, Doc. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you. Um, pleasure. Yeah, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today is uh, the eighth session of the Ebola Preparedness Series. Our topic today is on rapid response teams, and uh, the speaker is uh, yours truly, Boniface Waweru. He's an uh, epidemiologist uh, in uh, the Division of uh, Disease and Surveillance Response uh, in the Ministry of Health. And uh, we are happy to have him here to give us uh, and shed us light on how rapid response teams operate and what they normally do. As usual, um, sorry for the few challenges, but we will be uploading uh, most of our sessions online so that you can review them in case uh, you need to. So Boniface, thank you very much for, for coming and uh, we welcome you. I'm sorry, I think I've lost you. Hello? Uh, I sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm just basically, I just did a, a brief uh, introduction and I'm um, leaving the floor to you so that you can um, share your knowledge with us. Okay, then. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, you're audible and I can see your screen. Thank you so much. Um, as uh, I've been introduced, my name is uh, Boniface Wawero. I support the Ministry of Health um, in matters epidemiology and disease surveillance. I work in the Division of Disease Surveillance and Response. Uh, in a unit known as Epidemic Preparedness and Response. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, allow me to take you through uh, the content of rapid response. Um, so we have a few learning objectives. Uh, and the first one is to be able to explain what uh, RRT, uh, an RRT is, the characteristics of this team, and the rationale behind uh, its composition. Uh, also, at the end of uh, this presentation, we should be able to describe the composition of the teams and their particular roles uh, during, before and during uh, emergencies. And then we should be able to understand the standard operating procedures that guide how these teams operate. Uh, a brief introduction. Uh, rapid response is a key component of any yeah. uh, we are calling rapid response. RRTs have previously been deployed to respond to a number of disease outbreaks, uh, including the most recent one, uh, COVID-19. Uh, rapid response is a, an important part of the Ebola virus disease preparedness and response um, in, in Kenya. We currently have a, an EPR a plan for EVD um, uh, owing to the threat the country, uh, the Uganda outbreak poses to the country. And in the plan, a rapid response is a, is a whole subcommittee with uh, terms of references on how we're supposed to, 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 to operate, even before we report uh, the first confirmed case. So as of uh, 14th December, 2022, national and county rapid response teams have responded to uh, 24 suspected EVD alerts. These are suspected cases that uh, have a history of uh, travel from Uganda and the teams at national and county teams uh, and county levels uh, have been able to respond uh, rapidly, determine whether these uh, cases meet the case definition for EVD and were able to collect samples. But uh, 
Thankfully, uh, out of the total 24 cases, uh, none of the samples are stand positive for EVD. Uh, characteristics of uh, rapid response teams. Um, we like saying that an RRT is interdisciplinary as opposed to multidisciplinary. We will look at that in details uh, in the next slide. Uh, the team is both well-trained and equipped, and it's usually positioned in an area that is very, uh, very easy to deploy. So currently the National Rapid Response Team operates within the National Public Health Emergency Operations Center, which is uh, located within the Kenyatta National Hospital grounds. And that position is very uh, strategic. It becomes very easy for these teams to be deployed in the field uh, as need be, uh, if need be. Then the teams should be able to respond both efficiently and effectively, and they are coordinated with other response efforts uh, before and during uh, an outbreak or an emergency. Um, uh, rapid response teams must have a team leader and a number of team members uh, working interdisciplinarily uh, under the team leader. Um, sometimes you can have one team, one team member forming a part of the rapid response. So sometimes we're saying it's not pos it, 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 it sometimes a possible to have just one individual person responding to an emergency or a, a, an aspect of an emergency without necessarily being a team. And we can also have one team and a one team leader responding to an emergency. And sometimes we can have several team members organized in teams uh, re reporting to one overall team leader. So the team leader or the coordinator facilitates interactions among team members by conversing with different disciplines. And the team members uh, who are uh, multidisciplinary develop a working knowledge of each other's area of expertise to help them uh, work in an interdisciplinary uh, manner. Um, what is the difference between interdisciplinary uh, RRTs and multidisciplinary teams? When we refer to teams as multidisciplinary, it means that the team is comprised of different uh, technical people from various disciplines. So for, for example, we can have a, a clinician who is either a clinical officer or a medical doctor, sometimes even a nurse. We can have a laboratory officer in the team we can have a veterinary officer or doctor in the team. We can have an epidemiologist and so on. However, in a multidisciplinary team, these teams sometimes, you know, it's not possible for them to work as a team. So they remain as silos. So that if I'm a medical doctor working in a multidisciplinary RRT, I respond or answer to my immediate supervisor who is a doctor. So uh, engagement with other disciplines sometimes becomes uh, very limited within that team. When we refer to a team as interdisciplinary, this team will be comprised of a number of disciplines as I've stated above, but there's active collaboration between the disciplines so that if we have responded to an alert, uh, the rest of the teams will be able to support the laboratory officer in sample uh, collection, management, and, and transport, and transport to the, to the laboratory. That is collaboration uh, in operation. Uh, for us to achieve an interdisciplinary way of working in RRTs, the component boundaries are usually broken down. So that sometimes it becomes very difficult to distinguish between, between cadres or disciplines. So it's not just a summation of different disciplines or parts. Uh, it's a synthesis of the disciplines into something new, which is better coordinated and has a holistic approach to response. 
Um, when you think of rapid response teams in an emergency setting, then we have to consider the, the overall uh, emergency management uh, structure and the most uh, applicable management structure when it comes to emergencies is known as the Incident Management System, IMS, which is uh, headed by an incident manager. Uh, the incident manager happens to be the most experienced, um, someone who has a track record of response to that particular emergency. And then uh, he works in collaboration with teams. Uh, down there, you can see a, a planning section, an operation section, a logistics section, and a finance a stroke admin section. The location or the positioning of rapid response teams within this bigger system is usually under the operations uh, section, uh, where they work together with technical people, uh, but specifically, you'll find them in, under the field health operations, because 90% uh, of what rapid response teams are supposed to do uh, is usually in the field. We normally say that diseases begin at an end in the community. So that's specifically where the teams will be expected to work. But of course, all these sections, all these different subsections work together as one big team uh, within the EOC or the IMS structure. Um, we replicated a similar structure to help us prepare and respond uh, to the current AVD threat. And this is what we were able to come up with. So at the, at the top, we have uh, the National Emergency Response Committee, just as similar as we had uh, the one we had during COVID. Then below there, we have a national task force, which is currently headed by Dr. Patrick Amoth. And then below there, we have the incident manager who works uh, hand in hand with the EOC manager and the secretariat. Then we have the sections as, as in the previous slide. We have a planning section under which we have the surveillance, data management and risk communication and engagement teams. And then under operations, you have the key uh, rapid response team that we're discussing about today. Of course, there are other teams within the operations uh, section. What is the rationale for the rapid response teams? And we normally say that without the rapid response teams, the national and subnational authorities will not exactly know where a, a public health emergency may occur. So you need to have teams uh, in, in, in ready to be rapidly deployed so that uh, case detection and a response to that particular emergency happens as promptly as possible. Then decrease, decreasing the morbidity and mortality of a population during a public health emergency requires fast, in fact, as fast as possible a response. Delayed response will of course result to high morbidity and mortality. And then again, having a trained and ready to deploy team is essential for an effective emergency response. Uh, in this slide, we tried to look at the likely scenario. If we had an emergency and we, 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 we don't have a rapid response teams uh, in place or well-trained or supported with logistics during the preparedness phase, what how would the emergency burn out? And you, you can see that when after we report or detect the first case, uh, the first case may occur in the community down here at, at, at day seven, but due to improper uh, preparedness, it takes too long for the healthcare system to detect that outbreak. And that leads to a delayed response because by the time you're deploying, reactivating the teams and deploying them in the, in the field, it's already almost uh, too late. And the opportunity for, for control of that emergency or outbreak comes way later. And this obviously will lead to high mobile mobility and mortality within the population. So if we have a better preparedness uh, system, where we have rapid response teams uh, which are already uh, comprehensively trained 
and are well supported with logistics and are working in an interdisciplinary manner, it is very possible for us to 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 prevent very many cases and deaths from occurring in in a given emergency. So what we're saying is that a fully operational rapid response team is critical to act, to act immediately once a public health emergency is suspected. Normally we say it's possible to activate and deploy a team within 24 hours of the identification of a suspected case. The RRC acts as a resource, both within the earliest phase of a public health emergency as investigative support and during an ongoing emergency as site capacity. There's a point to note that for RRT to be fully functional, they need to be supported with a comprehensive training package and appropriate logistics. We are going to look at these two uh, later in, in, in much detail. Um, generically or ideally, this is the composition of a rapid response team where you want to have a team leader, then you want to have someone trained in clinical management, could be a doctor, a, cl a clinical officer or a nurse. Then in the team, you will work with an epidemiologist. You'll also have a surveillance officer, a communication uh, expert, or, a, or someone who is trained in risk communication and community engagement. You want to have a, a, a logistician in the team because you cannot deploy a rapid response team without the necessary logistics, which include uh, the PPE, the laboratory supplies, you know, the transport uh, logistics and things like that. Then you want to have a laboratory officer in the team because most of the time when you're responding to suspected alerts, there will, there will be need to collect a sample as soon as the team determines that that particular alert meets the case definition for that particular outbreak. Then this will also result in generation of data. You want someone who is experienced in data management. Then um, when you think of uh, transmission of diseases, especially in the healthcare settings and at the community, you need an IPC focal point who is trained in infection prevention and control. Then when you think of transmission of diseases uh, using the epidemiological triad, most diseases have vectors. Most of these, uh, most, most pathogens exist in, an, in a certain given environment. And some environmental factors encourage the growth and multiplication of these pathogens and vectors. And for that, you need an environmental health specialist Sometimes you may be dealing with diseases that are of zoonotic origin. In fact, majority of infectious, uh, most, most infectious diseases that affect man are from a zoonotic uh, origin. And in that case, you need a veterinary officer. Sometimes you may even go further and engage a wildlife uh, expert, especially if the transmission uh, originates from the wild animals. Uh, you may also need a water sanitation uh, hygiene specialist, normally referred to as wash specialist or experts, especially when we have a situation where water is involved, either as a medium for transfer of, 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 of you know, transfer of diseases via, you know, drinking contaminated water, or when you're dealing with complex humanitarian emergency which may compress or suppress uh, the available water sources. And this list or composition is not usually cast on stone. It can change depending on the nature of the emergency you're dealing with. So we are saying that uh, not every um, expertise needs to be on the RRT. That the number and composition of team depends on the type of emergency, the level of risk, the available resources and the geographic coverage of the emergency. Then um, there will be need to have a system where you can access experts or subject matter experts 
who are trained in specific areas that may come in handy during a preparedness and response to an emergency. And these teams include psychosocial support experts, hazardous material teams, especially if the emergency is of radio, nuclear, or chemical uh, origin. Then you need uh, vector control experts if you're dealing with a vector-borne diseases, a, a vector-borne disease. Uh, an example is uh, the confirmed yellow fever we had in Isiolo earlier in the year. Um, we had to send a vector control team to conduct a vector assessment and see how to reduce the vector population within the, that region. We will also need media experts because there is usually panic and anxiety during emergencies. We will need a trained uh, communication expert to know how to relay the necessary information to the public. Sometimes you need to work with nutrition specialists, burial teams, especially if the disease or outbreak you're, you're dealing with is associated with high case fatality rates, uh, such as Ebola. The current composition of EVD uh, RRT in Kenya, um, we have a team leader and a team, uh, I, I may not go, go through all, all this, uh, but this is basically the composition of the current uh, rap rapid response teams we have in Kenya. Uh, they are currently on a weekly rota where uh, they are supported with a driver, the necessary logistics, and where they also work uh, in collaboration with the rapid response teams uh, in the county and sub-county levels. Um, these teams are guided by some standard operating procedures and the SOPs for rapid response teams uh, have, very, have seven uh, very important areas. The first one being staffing and rostering. The second one uh, is administrative considerations. Then we have training, activation and pre-deployment, the actual deployment, post-deployment, and monitoring and evaluation. I want to start with the first one, but because, because of time we cannot, I know we cannot discuss all of them. So I'm going to zero in on staffing and rostering. And I'll also talk briefly about uh, training. But before I go to, the, to number one and three, uh, I will focus a bit on uh, uh, number two and talk about the administrative considerations that are captured in the SOPs. Um, when you decide to deploy a rapid response team, there are a number of administrative issues that must be considered. Number one, um, how are these team, teams going to, uh, to, to, to operate from day to day, given that they are working away from their workstations? So we are talking about uh, things like per DMs. We are talking about the, the, the aspects of reducing or minimizing the risk of them getting into danger or getting infected with the, with the, uh, the outbreak they're responding to. So issues to do with compensation, issues to do with the insurance, issues to do with the, you know, the, the other general administrative uh, issues that may need to be to be to be to be thought about uh, to support that team and to make sure that they work uh, comfortably in the field. Remember, effective uh, operation of the rapid response teams, as we have said, determines the magnitude of the emergency. So, how many cases or how many persons are going to be ultimately affected by this outbreak? Meaning, if they don't deploy and effectively, then uh, we are likely to, to have an explosion or amplification of the, of the outbreak. So allow me to talk about staffing and then later uh, zero in on uh, training. Staffing is uh, the first um, SOP uh, that the rapid response team relies on heavily. And when we're considering staffing the teams and rostering, we want to determine the key skills that are required for rapid response teams. So what is the outbreak or emergency uh, in, 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 in question? Um, if we think of EVD, for instance, we want to ask ourselves, 
what particular technical skills do we need in these teams? As I had said, um, diseases that have a zoonotic origin require that in the team, you must have a veterinary uh, doctor. Uh, if the transmission is coming from the world, especially among the wild animals, and you know, for the case of EVD, the natural reservoir is the, the birds, the fruit birds. Uh, in that scenario, you will also need to include uh, a wildlife expert. And you can even zero in on an wildlife, a wildlife expert who is uh, specially trained uh, on birds. If you're dealing uh, with something that, like avian influenza, over and beyond engaging a veterinary doctor or a wildlife expert, you want that particular expert who is experienced or has, has specialized training in birds, and we call him a ornithologist, because those are the kind of skills you want to inform uh, how the RRT operates and to give you insights that can help you in identifying a, a control for the outbreak. Then, once you do the mapping of the skills, you want to be able to identify where you'll get these particular candidates. And sometimes um, within the ministry, when we are thinking of rapid response teams and where to get the subject matter experts, we most likely uh, rely on institutions that are with or with uh, are within or outside the, the, the ministry. Uh, we work very closely with Kenya National Hospital. So whenever we are dealing with an outbreak of infectious uh, uh, origin, we'll work with infectious disease experts in Kenya National Hospital. When we we want to uh, when we're working with um, disease of zoonotic origin, then we go to institutes that deal with livestock uh, research. I'm talking about institutions such as ILRI. We also engage uh, institutions such as Cambry. We engage uh, learning institutions, the University of Nairobi and the others, because that's where you have uh, subject matter experts who can bring in the knowledge that is requisite and how the rapid response will operate. Then you select the candidates for RRT and you roster them. So it means um, if I have a list of 60, I will need to determine, I will need to form uh, teams considering all the requisite skills that we need. We need a doctor, we need an epidemiologist in that team, we need a veterinary, veterinary doctor, we need a someone who's skilled in vector assessment, we need a ornithologist, for instance, and form several of those teams. And then I'm going to decide the frequency in which these teams will, will take charge or will be activated. So currently for EVD, we have teams that are taking charge every week. From, from Monday to Sunday, every Monday to Sunday, we have a new team coming in. And this, the composition of this team is similar. It cuts across all the teams. And then, of course, uh, you put that in a roster. You have their contact details. You have um, the name of the driver, uh, and a driver who is identified to support this team. You have the name of the procurement officer, so that in case they need to deploy to the field and they need logistics, they exactly know how to get them. Then the roster will start uh, working and it gets to a point where it becomes rotational. From the first to maybe the fifth team, which is the last team, then you repeat from the first again uh, like that until the outbreak is either controlled or minimized uh, to manageable levels. Um, then when you think of training, the RRT uh, needs an in-depth knowledge on the subject matter. So in, in, in the case of EVD, you want the teams that you've already put in a rotor to be very knowledgeable on EVD. What is the epidemiology of Ebola virus disease? How is it transmitted? How has, been, how has the disease burden been looking back in history? 
what is the virology? Because if the pathogen is a virus, then you want to expose them or subject them to detailed understanding on, on that particular virus. How, is, how are the cases or suspected or confirmed cases managed? Where are they managed? If we are talking about an Ebola treatment unit, what is the design of an Ebola treatment unit? And when you think of treatment, for instance, we're talking about EVD, what are the necessary IPC standards and protocols that must be maintained? So all those areas must form the training package for this team. Then um, you also want to train them on case identification based on the case uh, definition, uh, contact tracing, listing, and follow-up, and referral. I want to, to emphasize more on that point, and I want to refer to the West Africa Ebola outbreak in 2015 and say that the amplification of the outbreak occurred as a result of lack of a system in place to identify primary and secondary contacts. We mean uh, persons who had come into contact with those uh, con already confirmed. And without that system, it, meant, it means that uh, you will be having people who have come into contact with confirmed cases interacting with the population. And later, you realize that the healthcare system is overwhelmed because of application of, of the cases. So you want to train the teams specifically on how to identify these contacts. They could be people living in the same households with a confirmed case. You want to list them and have all their details and follow the map up to the maximum incubation period for that disease to make sure that they, they did not develop signs and symptoms. And if they did, then you refer them to a new Ebola treatment unit. I've talked about matters IPC, but I will specify and emphasize on the personal protection. Uh, when you think of EVD uh, and think of transmission, then you realize on the you realize the importance of personal protective equipment. Uh, EVD is transmitted through direct contact. So it means if a team is going to respond during an EVD outbreak, then you want to make sure that those that are likely to be coming into contact with confirmed cases have, have no parts of their bodies exposed. So how do they don? Donning is putting on. And how do they doff, which is, of course, removing? How do they don and doff the personal protective equipment to make sure that Apologies, uh, it seems, uh, Dr. you're back. And Mr. Boneface, you're back. Can you unmute? We can't hear you, yeah. Fortunately, we still can't hear you, unless it's on my end. Nansu, can you hear me? I can hear you, Amina. Oh, okay, okay, so. Can, can you see my screen? Uh, it's uh, you're not sharing. Okay, let me let me reshare it. There was a disconnection of the network. Okay. So is it okay now? Yeah, it's okay. I'm on the slide. Uh, reading ra rapid response training components. Yes. Okay. So I I was explaining the importance of personal protection and uh, the fact that uh, EVD is uh, transmitted through direct contact. So you want the teams that are responding to uh, coming into contact with confirmed cases to be fully covered. No parts of their body, especially the mucous membrane, are exposed. 
So how do they don and dove successfully without infecting themselves? If you look at uh, the transmission rate of the current EVD in Uganda among the healthcare workers, um, 19 have contracted the disease and seven have already died. And that gives you a case fatality of about 30, 39, 37, 39%, which means uh, personal protection. The issue of donning and doffing for the teams is a priority when you think of EVD. Then um, you will be generating data from the exercise. Uh, how does the team uh, interact with the surveillance and reporting tools? and how do they update them as the outbreak uh, changes. Then you would want to uh, focus on a very specific uh, training on CMEX, which we refer to as simulation exercises, because simulation exercises are uh, important to keep on testing how well your preparedness plans uh, are. For the case of rapid response teams, you would want to continue, uh, you know, uh, constantly uh, test how good uh, the, the SOPs, the standard operating uh, procedures for these teams are by conducting a number of simulation exercises. Then of course, uh, you need to train them on soft skills, including uh, communication skills. Um, rapid response teams operate in two phases, during an emergency and before the emergency. So we have the non-emergency phase, and the emergency phase. So the non-emergency phase uh, summarizes all the activities that would go on before the outbreak happens. So it could be during the preparedness phase. So what would be what would be the rapid response teams uh, do be doing as they anticipate and prepare to respond to an outbreak? So the first thing will be to develop the SOPs to make sure that we have standard operating procedures in place and improve them. Then the next thing you will be to make sure that you have the right staff. Do you have the right subject matter experts mapped out already? Have you uh, engaged your stakeholders? Do you have teams? And when you have these teams, have you rostered the, the, the RRTs? And is the roster uh, working? Uh, of course, being supported by the logistics. Do the teams have the right uh, PPEs? Do the teams uh, have the right supplies in case they need to collect lab samples? Then you want to test uh, their readiness. And this readiness is usually done in form of exercises. We refer to them as uh, CMXs. They could do a tabletop exercise. They could do a drill. Or sometimes you can do a full-scale uh, uh, simulation exercise to just test on how ready the rapid response teams are in case an outbreak or an emergency happens. Then you keep on training them and retraining them as, uh, as, as necessary uh, as possible. Then uh, when the outbreak happens, the first thing you need, you need to do is activate the rapid response teams as you activate the, the public health emergency operations center. And then um, you want to take them through a pre-deployment briefing to make sure that uh, you have the requisite team uh, members, the right training, and they have uh, in details the exact procedure they are supposed to follow as they respond to, 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 to the outbreak. And then there's the actual deployment. And during the actual deployment, there is a constant communication and reporting Remember, these teams are in the field. There is constant communication within them and uh, in the incident, the larger incident management system. And then there is a monitoring and evaluation that is going on during deployment. What is working? What is not working? How do we improve it? And team evolution and demobilization. Sometimes you will send a team to the ground and one of them falls sick. How do you replace them? Sometimes we'll find a team will get to the epicenter of the outbreak and one of them gets exposed. How do you make sure that they are quarantined? And as they do that, uh, you get a replacement uh, in that team. And then once you do that, uh, you conduct a post-deployment briefing and this now becomes a continuous cycle. 
because the operations the, or how the rapid response teams uh, operated during COVID-19 is being inherited as we prepare to respond to EVD. So we are looking at uh, the challenges that the teams went through uh, and the areas of improvement so that uh, when we think of EVD response, where the team or the general population is not caught uh, unawares. Um, when you think of training, and there's a good reason as to why I keep on emphasizing and re-emphasizing on training. In fact, I'm emphasizing and re-emphasizing on two aspects, and which, uh, of course, we mentioned up there, that for rapid response teams to work efficiently and effectively, they have to be comprehensively trained, and they have to be supported by logistics. So for training, we have a cycle where uh, you onboard new rapid response team members uh, when there is no outbreak. Uh, within the ministry, we heavily rely on uh, uh, residents. We call them the Field Epidemiology and Lab Training Program residents. It's a training program within the Ministry of Health. And these teams are usually drawn from, from the counties. And during their two year uh, training, they are placed, most of them will have to do a rotation in the EOC or in the Division of Disease Surveillance and Response. And it is during that time that you have an opportunity to, to onboard new uh, rapid response teams. Once you do that, then you some education. And um, remember, it's during the non emergency phase. So you train them, you first have to do a needs assessment when, when you onboard them to identify the training needs. And then you train them. Then as you do this, you're constantly uh, testing uh, your preparedness through simulation exercises. And through this, they learn. Then in the event that a public health emergency happens, you'll have to conduct a pre-deployment -pre briefing and a certain uh, short training we normally refer to a just-in-time training. So the team is ready to be deployed in the field. What are these important components you need to train them on? And then you send them to execute the mission in the field. Then from the experience, once you conduct the post-deployment briefing, um, you identify, you want to identify the key challenges and gaps that the team experienced so that they can address uh, through further training and retraining. Um, then I thought it's necessary for us to look at the major activities for rapid response teams in EVD preparedness and response. And this has been drawn uh, directly from the current emergency uh, preparedness plan we have for EVD for the country. And in the plan, um, there are a number of activities uh, uh, spelled out, but generally uh, the team is expected to investigate alerts, rumors, and media reports on outbreaks and other public health emergencies. So there's a team at the EOC that constantly sits and does the, a media search. What is being reported from what source? Uh, what rumors are being reported through the toll-free numbers? Uh, what reports are we receiving from health facilities at the sub-county levels or even in the private health sector? And how true are these uh, alerts and rumors? How do we confirm them? Once we confirm them, how do we uh, mobilize a team to respond to that? Then the team will also propose or apply strategies and appropriate uh, field investigation methods. Remember, this team is well trained uh, in outbreak investigation then the team will be expected to conduct control measures and interventions, and as well as carrying out risk communication activities, coordinating response activities in collaboration with national and international authorities, communities and other stakeholders, and supporting training and capacity building. The RRT also develops brief periodic uh, situation reports, we call them CTRIPS, and detailed investigation reports that come later uh, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the outbreak. And then finally, they conduct other activities as needed. So in our plan, uh, the plan spells out three uh, possible scenarios for EVD. And the first scenario 
is referred to as the best case scenario. So we don't have a case, we have zero cases. How is the rapid response team supposed to operate? And the first thing they need to do is map and constitute EVD uh, teams at national and county uh, and sub-county levels. So we have uh, people identified at, at, the, at the national level, they're already on a, on a rotating uh, rotor. Then we have these teams uh, identified at county and sub-county levels. Uh, they may not be trained uh, fully, but at least uh, a number of them are already trained as we speak. Then um, a, a plan is in, in, is, it, is in place to continue building capacity for these teams. You want to be able to equip them to be able to respond and evacuate alerts as, as early and as immediate as possible. You have to be able to est establish that they are able to identify and list contacts, uh, list contacts of suspected cases. Then still during that period when you have zero cases, a procurement and propositioning of EVD RRTs and essential commodities such as PPEs and sample collection equipment is already ongoing. Then designation of utility vehicles, making sure that they are serviceable uh, and ambulances for evacuations. Uh, are they serviceable? We have a, a, a fuel, uh, an impress for fuel maybe, so that in case you want to deploy them, then you will not have to, to, to suffer challenges of movement. Then uh, you'll be conducting EVD rapid needs assessment, including uh, outbreak simulations. The second scenario that, was spelled up, uh, that has been spelled out in the plan is um, we get a case and then we have about uh, five cases. At that point, how does the rapid response team uh, operate? And the first thing will be to activate the national uh, and respective county and sub-county level rapid response teams. Uh, at this point, they are now trained, they are supported with the logistics and supplies. So they will be able to respond to and evacuate alerts. They will also be able to identify and list contacts of suspected cases. And then the national rapid response teams will provide support to the county and sub-county uh, teams and then uh, development of EVD alerts spot trips, which will be shared uh, within the larger incident management uh, system. We also imagined a worst case scenario where the cases, uh, the outbreak has been confirmed and we are now having an explosion which exceeds uh, more than five cases. Um, the first thing will be to activate the rapid response teams at all levels, respond to and evacuate alerts, identify and list contacts of suspected cases, and the teams, uh, you know, the national rapid response teams will also support the county and sub-country uh, rapid response teams. Remember we said uh, diseases begin and end at the community. So the frontline uh, rapid response team that is easy to deploy to the epicenter or to the, to the, to the emergency will be that that sits nearest the community, and that's the sub-county rapid response teams. And then, of course, the teams will be expected to develop uh, spot traps, which will be shared within the larger incident management system. Um, how do you deploy um, these teams to the field? The deployment of uh, RRTs must be carefully planned and prepared. I'm sorry for the typo. Uh, this preparation is based on three things. Number one, a good knowledge of the geographical context, the social dynamics of that affected population, as well as the political and security situation of the areas where the team will be deployed. Then a logistics uh, supply plan based on the team's actual plan approved by all those who will be part of the operations. And in this plan, there has to be uh, a plan for pre-positioning the, the, the equipment. So the teams are not expected to move with the equipment to the field. A, a, a working system is where the teams find this place, the, the, these supplies and logistics already pre prepositioned in those areas uh, where the emergency is going on. Then the team must be properly equipped to ensure survival and health. We're talking about uh, things like survival kits, first aid kits, cash, 
you know, vaccinations before response and things like that. Um, we've looked at training and we want to look at logistics because we are saying it will be impossible to deploy a team to the field if they're not well trained and if they're not supposed, supported with the right logistics. So you need to have a procurement plan as you continue preparing for to respond to an outbreak. Uh, a procurement plan is put in place and that this begins with a needs assessment. What specific logistics and supplies does the rapid response team require? And how do we purchase them? Once we purchase them, how do we store them in the central uh, facility? And how do we come up with a transport or distribution mechanism to make sure that they are prepositioned, well prepositioned in areas that are likely to report an outbreak? So when the team gets to the field, there needs to be a hotline uh, to the call center. The call center will be placed at the EOC, the National uh, FIOC. Then um, you'll have to work in close co collaboration with the other team that will be on the ground, a local medical officer, maybe working in the Ebola treatment unit or in the facility. You want to brief and work together with an, a transfer team that operates the ambulances then you want to create a linkage as soon as you get to the field to the designated Ebola treatment unit, the designated uh, reference laboratory that can has a capacity to run, uh, for some, uh, run samples. In the case of VVD, you want to work with a biosafety level three and above laboratory. Then you also want to integrate and get, uh, get updates from uh, the IPC team because remember, they also need logistics. You cannot assure standard uh, IPC precautions for EVD if that team is not, uh, is not well, well stocked. So you need to be able to get updates from them because at the end of the day, we are, work, we are looking at the team work in the response uh, to an outbreak. Then if a disease has a case fatality rate, in fact, higher or high case fatality rate such as EVD, you'll have a well-trained uh, burial team. So how do you collaborate uh, as, as the team, as this RRT receives alerts directly from the community of a community death, how do you collaborate and work as, together with the burial team and other teams, making sure that the internment of the dead body is done in a, in a safe uh, uh, and dignified manner? And of course, you want to create linkage and work with other stakeholders who are operating at the lower level. Um, these are some of the PPEs. Uh, when you're thinking of logistics and procurement of uh, supplies that the rapid response team and members can, 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 can use, uh, specifically for PPEs, this is what you'd uh, need uh, as standard for, for rapid response teams. You need a head cover, you need Googles, you need face masks, you need respirators, face shields, gowns or coveralls, aprons, gloves, the boots, and I think uh, we also need a face shield. Uh, oh, it's there, it's up there. Um, what I want to talk, to say about the PPEs now is that number one, you need to have a checklist uh, so that as you deploy, you make sure that you have all the PPEs. Number two, the PPEs must be of the right size. I've seen situations where a team is deploying to the field and one, one member of the team probably wears shoe size number 38 and the only boots available are size 44. And that now means that it will not be possible for that particular team member to, to uh, uh, promptly uh, or effectively respond to the outbreak. So you need, in a, in a working scenario, you want to have predetermined the team members and their, the, 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 the sizes that fit them. And these sizes must be adequate because sometimes it's possible to contaminate uh, a PPE and that will force you to remove that PPE and don another PPE immediately. So we're talking about uh, quantity, size, and uh, quality also. Um, the PPEs are organized by the, the logistician, 
making sure that uh, they are available in all those sizes and quantities we're talking about, and they are prepositioned. So when the logistician plans to preposition these PPEs, uh, they use any means possible. Uh, please bear in mind that disease outbreaks occur anywhere without, sometimes without notice. And some of these places are hard to reach, but you have to make sure you look for every way possible to make sure that these logistics reach those particular areas. So sometimes you can use air, sometimes you can use uh, narrow roads, sometimes you can even use, uh, like in the last photo you can see, uh, these, are, these are vehicle, a logistics vehicle loaded with logistics and it's, it's being balanced between two, 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 two boats or dows to be able to cross to the other side to reach uh, the, the affected population. Remember we said this process of prepositioning logistics should be done before the rapid response teams get to the ground. It would be a very unfortunate situation where the team gets to the ground before the logistics. So they feel helpless because they cannot respond, yet they're already on the ground because of lack of the right uh, uh, PPEs and supplies. Um, once on the ground, the, logisti the logistician identifies and sets up spaces and infrastructures needed for activities for the, of the RRT. This could be communication uh, systems, it could also be uh, accommodation, you know, where will the team uh, be operating at? Uh, where will be the team, uh, where will the team be meeting? And what precautions must be put in place to make sure that the team is safe at all times. Remember, if the safety of the team is, is, is not assured, that will greatly hamper how the the response uh, to the outbreak is, is conducted. So these are just examples of logistics uh, for EVD. You need to uh, consider personal and team health and make sure that uh, things like vaccinations, if they're going to areas with endemic diseases, then the team is appropriately, appropriately uh, vaccinated against those diseases. Then they have personal health kits, they have the hand sanitizers, if you're going into a malaria endemic zone, they have the prophylaxis and the first aid kits, thermometers, and things like that. Then they will also need printed materials, quite a number of them. They will need information and communication technologies. They will have uh, to use laptops, printers, internet tokens, especially in areas with uh, uh, not so good uh, uh, network coverage, phones with extra phone credit, radios as required, including power backups for this uh, technology. Then under medical, you will also want to have them get equipped with the rehydration infusion sets, ORS and treatment, treatment courses. Then in the field, you want them to have the right PPEs and IPC materials. Then uh, under transport, they need to be, to have access to cars or scooters and fuel. And I think we mentioned about that. And then their finances, access to mechanism to release emergency funds and uh, funds and budgets. Um, winding up, this becomes the last uh, slide. And there are four key messages I would want us to retain even after we finish this presentation. Number one, the rapid response teams uh, are essential for a comprehensive response to an alert uh, and should be ready 24-7, uh, that is round the, the clock. To be effective, the team should be trained, equipped, and supported under the EOC or an equivalent structure. The RRT is multifunctional and the members have complementary uh, roles. We talked about the interdisciplinary uh, way of working as opposed to multidisciplinary. Then the RRT should respond within 24 hours of a first reported suspected case. That brings me to the end of this uh, short presentation. I thank you for your uh, patience. Um, I will now welcome questions and answers.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonfess, for that uh, uh, interesting uh, approach to how to set up rapid response teams and using the WHO guidelines. So for the audience, kindly do not hesitate, post questions on the Q&A. We'll try and address as many as possible. And um, one, one of the most glaring ones is uh, engagement uh, of uh, the previous people who have worked in, um, in, uh, in, in a setting where Ebola was there. How, how are we tapping into such resources? I know uh, before we mentioned that some of them are already engaged in training and uh, perhaps uh, do we have uh, probably the question I would have to, uh, to understand better because it keeps being a recurring topic in the, in the webinar series is uh, do we have a database of all healthcare workers in different cadres who have worked in settings whereby uh, we have had Ebola, so that we can uh, we can see how we can tap into the ones who are willing, because uh, it seems like uh, it's an able team and they're very eager to continue the the good work that they've been doing. One face. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Arin. Uh, I want to respond uh, to that question, uh, a very wonderful question, by saying that. Um, We've had um, a database, but it has been mm -hmm. very challenging to update it. Okay. I agree we have healthcare workers within mm -hmm. the healthcare system and outside, people who went as volunteers to West Africa. We have people, mm -hmm. uh, technical people who've responded to many other outbreaks and emergencies, including outside the country. So what we are now doing uh, as we prepare for EVD, is to work very closely with the coordination team. If you look at the incident management structure uh, okay. of, of UVD, we have a very important subcommittee that deals with matters coordination. So this brings, um, they're able to, to map out the various stakeholders and mm -hmm. using that channel, we are now able to identify from these departments or from these other key sectors, how many people uh, have responded to what outbreaks and what uh, key skills are they bringing on, on board? On so board. We are continually, yeah, yeah, we are continually coming up and developing uh, the, the existing Your uh, database, database, which was not mm. initially well updated. Uh, yeah. Sometimes when we are we interacting with uh, sub-counties during the trainings, we are very shocked to find out that even at the sub-county levels and the health facilities, we have people with a wealth of experience, either mm -hmm. in community response or response to other emergencies, which include disasters. And the reason I'm talking about all these things uh, outside EVD is because sometimes uh, you find ourselves, we find ourselves in a situation where we are responding to an outbreak in a complex humanitarian emergency sort of environment. So you have population movements, uh, mm -hmm. maybe people mm -hmm. are running away from war on zones, and there's a, a serious outbreak as EVD. So when you think of that, the subject matter experts you want to bring on board into the database include people with humanitarian experience. It is one thing to be to respond to an outbreak as an epidemiologist or as a doctor, and it's another to respond to an outbreak in a complex humanitarian emergency where you will need some other skill sets that are normally not uh, within the healthcare system. Uh, that's that's good, and I and I think that's 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 the way to go. That's the best direction because um, human resource is one of the most valuable resources, you know, in especially in healthcare. And um, our field is quite fast. So if we if we can tap into the resource, the, the people who already have uh, immense experience, it would be great for us to 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 know. And uh, probably that's something um, the ministry can look into in terms of people, you know, like volunteering that information. Because sometimes, uh, if if it's fully dependent on um, 
on um, on the ministry because the ministry has a lot of information to process it it could be a, a good guide and uh, we can use this as a probably life changing um, experience in uh, in uh, in Kenya to tap into uh, highly specialized and highly uh, specific things to to do and i agree with you uh, we need uh, more people with that disaster experience and uh, in our trainings for disaster, we realized medicine plays a very small role, critical, but very small role compared to the others. So uh, in that line, um, one of the audience is asking, how does one apply to be part of the RRT? Is it something that is open or it's something that uh, it's just uh, done by chance or coincidence or whoever is available? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I'll link, I'll link this with the first uh, response I gave. When, when you come up with the database, we have two different types of database. One, we are, we are developing a database for subject matter experts. And number two, we are developing a database for what we call normally referred to as search capacity. So in case there's an outbreak, and um, we need more hands. We need to tap into those people with a set of skills that can come in and get very quickly uh, trained to join the rest of the team in the response. So currently, uh, we have drawn, if you look at the rapid response team members, they have largely been drawn from the Ministry of Health, different divisions in the ministry, but I feel there is still need because we, we are very limited in the number that we are working with. I think currently we, we have about uh, 60 and I think it would be it would be better if we expanded that to, to cover, to, to have as many members as possible. So if we have uh, uh, participants in this webinar that have the right skills to form a uh, members or team teams for rapid response, I think uh, then we can have a way of getting their details so that we update them and, uh, and, and join them into the bigger team. Thank you. Over, over to you, Dakari. Sorry, I, I didn't I didn't realize I was on mute. Um, so as I'm waiting for more questions from the audience, maybe I can uh, try to uh, get a bit of uh, clarification. Um, this uh, rapid uh, response team, I, I, I love how you've uh, made the presentation and uh, I probably would like to understand better in terms of um, how fast are they constituted? Is it is it cause cause there's devolution right now in uh, in healthcare? Is it now the primary responsibility of uh, say the counties, especially the ones that border, like let's say Busia, to constitute this rapid response, or would it be um, uh, a national thing? Uh, and 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 as a point, I can I can uh, cite the learning lessons from COVID because initially most of the rapid response was actually from from national before going to 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 county, uh, even in terms of taking sample, collecting sample collection and everything of that sort. So what are the learning lessons we've taken from COVID and how are we going to apply it in, in preparing as we're preparing for Ebola? Thank you for the good question. Um, I, I think I had mentioned that the, the front line and the first line uh, response is, is normally at the sub-county level. So the sub-county rapid response team becomes the first in line to be deployed. But depending on the nature of the outbreak and the magnitude, the county teams can request for specific technical support from the national in the spirit of devolution. And also depending on the, whether the disease is a pandemic or whether it poses a, a security threat, uh, it, it, it now means that other 
key organs can need to come in uh, in the response to coordinate the response. And you're right, uh, as you, you've rightly put it, that during the COVID-19, the coordination was being done at the national level through the National Emergency uh, Response Committee. Uh, because COVID uh, on its own was seen as a security threat. So in, in the event of EVD, then I think uh, that coordination will still have to happen at that high level. But even before we get the case, uh, we have the National Task Force already formed and it's regularly meeting. And at the county level, we have the, the, the task, task force, the county task force in place. And all these teams are working in coordination. Um, lessons, if there is one lesson I think we've learned uh, from COVID, which we need to really uh, uh, employ as we prepare and respond to EVD is uh, the community. Uh, in, the, in the COVID era, uh, I think most of these activities that came or were put in place including the organs such as the National Emergency Rescue Committees, all these things were, came about after the country had already confirmed the outbreak. But in EVD, we have an opportunity uh, to work and do as much as we can during the preparedness phase because we are yet to receive or confirm a, or confirm a case. So if there's one thing we, we are emphasizing on that was, I think, uh, that gave us a lot of lessons from the previous experience, is how we interact with the community. And we are trying to uh, adapt our systems to make sure that uh, when we think of something like training, you know, ideally we train from the national, we get the national TOTs, they go to the counties, they train county TOTs, county TOTs train the sub county TOTs. So the community at the end of the day becomes the lowest level and the last in line. So in this case, we are trying to, to work to see, even as we plan for trainings to cascade from national, have we gotten, have we ran to the community and shared the key health messages uh, in a manner of, you know, in a way of sensitizing them so that as the outbreak begins, uh, then the community is already aware that this, this disease is, this is EVD, these are the risk factors, and this is what we need to do to, to prevent or control the disease. So as we do these other things, then community engagement uh, also needs to be, to be expedited. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, uh, also, um, thank you for the answer. And uh, one of the participants actually was asking uh, regarding the community, it's good that you've already pointed it out before, and maybe you can expound further. Uh, to what extent do you involve community in simulations as sensitization step? Um, my, my colleague uh, will be making a presentation, I think tomorrow on risk communication and community engagement. And mm -hmm. I think I uh, provide uh, the best, the best Be response. Better, so, yeah. So we will keep that in the parking lot, John. Yes. Uh, we'll get that uh, information tomorrow. I hope you'll be able to join in. And if not, you'll get the recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, Teresa is asking, uh, sorry, before Teresa, Hillary was asking, in, uh, in Kenya, which are the most uh, at-risk counties and are, there, are they sufficiently prepared for rapid response for the disaster of EVD? Should the sites that were set in isolated areas for COVID-19 be considered for such outbreaks and should the two teams operate to avoid cross-infection while addressing such emergencies? What's your advice for inclusion of all healthcare workers to undergo such trainings? I know he's asked so many questions, but uh, I, I, in, in a nutshell, yeah, in a nutshell, uh, are we prepared in the in the in the counties that uh, are mapped out as risk counties? Uh, in in the previous session, uh, the mapping was uh, based on uh, the data data that of, of the traveling of trucks. Uh, there were some counties that were pointed out. Uh, are people in those particularly sub-counties ready for this? And are we separating Ebola and COVID and uh, are the two teams going to work together? So over to you, Bonnie. 
Thank you for the questions. Um, what I'd like to say is that um, we have counties mapped as high-risk counties, but what we are continually uh, stressing during our interactions is that the first case is likely to be reported anywhere in the country, including in those counties that are not in the risk map. And this is uh, based on uh, the, the knowledge we continue to gather. Just the other day, we, we, I'll use an example of Garissa County. Garissa County is not in the map, but uh, from further engagement with the county, we learned that we have Ugandan refugees in Dadaab uh, refugee camp. Again, uh, the Ugandan soldiers that are responding to the war in Somalia sometimes use uh, the, the road through Garissa to Somalia. Uh, uh, and that, of course, may put any county along that route uh, at risk. So what we're doing is um, based on resources, we have a, a list of 20 counties we are, we are, we are, we are prioritizing, but not forgetting that a, a, a case can be reported in any other counties that any other any other county that is not in this list, and for that I think uh, on availability of resources we are continu continually engaging them uh, uh, as, as it is. Uh, on COVID and EVD and isolations, there is an elaborate uh, process to engage the counties to see how they can come up with the designs of an Ebola treatment unit. Because um, one principle in disease control, especially during outbreaks, is to contain diseases at source. So it will be counterproductive to refer a case to the Kenyatta National Hospital uh, Referral Isolation Unit um, from way down in the counties, a far away county. That, that will basically increase the risk of uh, transmission to, to the uninfected population. So these are an elaborate effort to make sure that um, we have isolation centers or in Ebola treatment units in counties that can be relied upon in the event uh, of an active uh, outbreak. I don't know whether I've missed uh, any other question from the participant. Um, but I think um, I think we talked about the lessons. Yeah, have I yeah. missed uh, something, Atari? Uh, not really. I think uh, you've been amazing in answering that. And um, uh, one of the other questions is on prison. Um, prisons and police cells can play a significant role. Um, like in the so we we are getting worried when we are hearing Garissa and other places. I'm just noting that. <laughs> so we're, you're opening up basically our mind that the surveillance is actually quite good to pick up uh, more than the mapped up risk areas, and it it's it's really good information for for me personally, and I and I believe the audience at large. Um, Teresa is asking on prisons and police cells can play a significant role in outbreak spread and magnification given its congregate state and the movements involved between the community and prison for inmates. Is there a need to have prisons and police officer with key skills in national and county RRT? I think it's a very good question. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for the wonderful question. I, I will take us back to COVID-19. And during the response to the outbreak, um, we had uh, officers from the military, officers from the police force and the prisons seated at the national uh, EOC, working together with the national rapid response teams in the, in the, in the response to the, to the outbreak. I believe um, in the event that we, we are dealing with EVD, we'll still uh, include those key uh, departments because uh, you can imagine of a, of a disease that is transmitted through direct contact in a concentrated institution. It will actually be a, a, serious, a serious disaster. So uh, we, we are very cognizant of, of, of that fact. And uh, we, we are happy that we are 
you know, inheriting so many lessons and so many best practices that were already put in place during COVID-19. Okay, uh, I hope. Uh, okay, uh, another question is about from the experience. We've noted that there's an issue of Ebola. It's only limited to public health officers and they rarely share information or consult other cadres. Is it ideal to follow up after training whether the trained people prepare RRT teams and have regular meetings? I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of that. The fact that uh, these, these measures or activities are restricted to one particular cadre because uh, our approach from the national uh, especially when you're thinking of rapid response teams and the fact that we've said that they are multidisciplinary is that we are involving all the cadres uh, that are relevant to EVD preparedness and response. Okay, and, and uh, maybe just to note, this is actually part of the training uh, that the Ministry of Health is doing. Uh, as you've noticed, most of the audio speakers are actually uh, officers from the Ministry of Health and they're doing a terrific job. The reach is quite good. And um, furthermore, if somebody wants to get all of what we've been learning, they can get it uh, online and, uh, and learn more. So I, I believe uh, the, the, the Bonfest of just commending the ministry in, uh, in, in widening the scope and making sure that we reach more people because uh, the platform is actually not for one particular cadre but all. And uh, we've noted the lab team, uh, the request on getting CPD points and uh, our team will work on it definitely. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to see how we can work better and make it better for all healthcare professions. Um, so uh, the last one is from Emily, uh, good presentation. Uh, about enhancing community sensitization, is that possibility of involving community pharmacy professions in the trainings? This is because just the name reads, we are the closest people to the community and we can reach a vast region in uh, creating awareness. And I agree with Emily, to some extent, we have a culture of just going straight to the chemist to, to buy medications. So uh, what's your take on that, Bonfis? Are we segmenting them like purposely looking for the community pharmacist to see because I would know the first uh, stop for most uh, Kenyans? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I agree that there is a very big risk uh, when the community buys drugs directly from the chemist and um, risk communication and community engagement could be a solution or an answer to that. I'm happy my colleague uh, will be having a presentation on the same tomorrow. And I think uh, we can put uh, that question on the parking lot uh, for tomorrow. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry, I didn't know I was on mute. Uh, let me repeat the question. Uh, I believe this is Dr. Juma. Uh, she says, thanks for the presentation. What level of outbreaks does the rapid response team deal with? Is it only public health emergencies of international concern? Uh, in Nairobi right now, we have a cholera outbreak. I'm curious as to whether the rapid response team is involved. And thank you very much, Doc, for pointing that out because um, like another audience pointed out, are we separating COVID uh, rapid response team and Ebola and uh, cholera? And if we are, is that the most efficient way of, uh, of, of doing this? Over to you, Bonfess. Bonfest has uh, stepped out. 
but uh, I think just network issues. But Dr. Militim, oh, he's back. But, but Dr. Mary Tim, if you can, Mary Tim, if, you, if you'll if you be able to answer that, it will uh, go a long way. But Bonface, if you're back and you're able to respond, we will appreciate. Yes, Dr. Sorry, sorry Dr. I lost connection again. Sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, the question is on rapid response team. Uh, is 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 it, are the rapid response team currently only looking at public health emergencies which are of international concern like COVID and Ebola? Because uh, in Nairobi right now, we're having a cholera outbreak. So is it the same rapid response team that will solve the issue of cholera? Or is it different? Because even in the other question, uh, they were they were asking, do we have like a COVID one and an Ebola one? And it really needs to come out clear. And uh, if 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 it is indeed different teams, is it the most efficient way of uh, utilizing the human resource? Over to you, Bonface. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Uh, apologies for the disconnection. Um, the rapid response teams are guided by guidelines from the World Health Organization, and we refer to them as uh, Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response uh, Guidelines, IDSR. In the guidelines, we have a list, a list of priority diseases, conditions, and public health uh, uh, events. And we normally adopt an all hazards approach to emergencies because we are now uh, uh, aware that morbidity and mortality doesn't only come from infectious diseases. So we are now focused on all hazards, meaning we are looking at uh, potential disease outbreaks. We are looking at um, events that can lead to mass uh, deaths in the population. So issues to do with chemical events, just to give you an example, methanol poisoning is becoming rampant in Kenya. We are losing populations day by day from consumption of illicit brew that of course it adulterated with methanol. Um, we also have events that are of radionuclear uh, origin. If some, some of us can remember, there is a lorry that exploded uh, near Naivasha and uh, there was a whole traffic behind it and so many people died from that, uh, that event. So the approach the rapid response teams are now adopting is that all hazards so that we are effective in making sure that we reduce either mobility and, and mortality. Uh, on cholera in Nairobi, uh, we know there is cholera in Nairobi and other counties. And I want to say that uh, the rapid response teams are at the center of, 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 of the response. However, I remember the rapid response teams do not work in isolation. We are, they are working within an incident management system. And this IMS system has other teams with specific roles. So the issue of coordination during outbreak response becomes, becomes a priority. So it means we have teams that are rapidly responding, responding to the outbreak in Nairobi and working in collaboration with other teams within the incident management system. Omar. Uh, thank you. Quite interesting. Um, so, it, so it's it, it's beyond even infection. Sorry, because I understood um, the, the drugs, and uh, unless I I I understood wrongly. Sour, sour. Uh, so I think uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bonface. And uh, I'd like to give Dr. Maritim uh, a chance to add or subtract something from the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amina. And uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation on the rapid uh, response uh, team. Uh, it was really um, uh, a great presentation and I was listening in because for a very long time, I wasn't very clear 
what actually the rapid response team uh, does, how it's comprised and constituted. But uh, listening to Dr. Waweru's presentation, it was really, really um, a great presentation, putting everything into perspective and really helping us to understand where we've reached so far and the role that the rapid response team um, has uh, played. And I sit in the National Task Force, so I'm glad to see where I fit in that uh, organogram. So this is really uh, commendable for breaking it down, making it easy. There was one thing I wanted to speak to that came up as a question. And one of the things, and we really want to urge all people who attend trainings, training has to come with a responsibility. If you are selected to attend a training on behalf of a county, do not see it only as an opportunity to be away from your facility, to attend the training, to listen in, but really the ultimate aim of that training for you who are attending, who are selected few to attend, is to disseminate the training and put into action what you've learned in the training. So for example, if you're among the people who are trained as part of the CHMT team, one of the expectations is that you would actually form the, uh, or, or put in place the process of forming the RRT for the county so that training has to come with responsibility. For some of you who are fortunate enough to attend these webinars, again, it comes with a responsibility and that would include disseminating these trainings to others who may not have been fortunate to attend, perhaps sharing with them the link so that they can be able to attend uh, future sessions. But we need to remember that actually training comes with responsibility. And what you find, because I'm a trainer at the university, is that when you train people, it actually helps you even to remember the content of that training. It reinforces the learning. And that's one challenge I want to pose to all of us who are joining uh, this session. I love the question by Dr. Juma asking about the cholera outbreak and the role of RRT. And this came up again yesterday. It has come up frequently when we are having this uh, EVD webinars. And maybe what I'm adding to Amina and KNH team is perhaps we can consider having a presentation on cholera and the cholera outbreak, maybe as a follow-up, so that you can be able to give people an opportunity to know what is cholera, what are we doing, how can we prevent uh, ourselves from getting infected? Because for mm -hmm. now, where we've with cholera, all of us are actually vulnerable. Every time you're eating somewhere or drinking some water that you don't know where the source is in our country, mm -hmm. we are actually at risk of uh, getting cholera. So my urge is that we should consider having a presentation on cholera and we can actually have even the, the incident, uh, the IMT team, because they are part of the National EOC Center to come and even give us where we are with this cholera outbreak. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What are the, the benefits that we have? Uh, like, what, 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 where are we in terms of the response? What are the future plans? So maybe that is just one challenge to Dr. Waweru and his team that they can take back to EOC and we can plan for that session either before the festive season or uh, as soon as possible, so that even as mm. people travel, we can actually um, be aware of cholera and the risk that we face on a daily mm. uh, basis. But I want to thank uh, Dr. Waweru uh, very much for coming and sharing what uh, the RRT teams are, are doing. And tomorrow we'll have a very interesting session on uh, community, risk communication and community engagement. And we'll get to hear actually the messaging that has been designed for the community how the community has been sensitized and engaged in the high risk counties and what um, uh, all this is translating to in terms of our preparedness to respond to the outbreak. So thank you so much, uh, Amina, for great moderation. Thank you for the audience, for the wonderful questions uh, that you've asked. And one of the things also that we need to take up is really to develop the database of those people who volunteered in previous outbreaks and to have that as a national resource that can be quickly deployed uh, as part of preparedness and even to respond, because that's a wealth of experience that uh, cannot be taken for granted. So thank you so much, Amina, and over mm -hmm. to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. And just, just to add, uh, this, this webinars have been uh, very impactful in terms of uh, making policies, in fact, of sharing with, uh, with 
some of the team uh, in uh, KMA and uh, the students uh, for UHC that from, from this webinars, we actually ended up developing the sexual harassment policy, which I think Kenya is one of the few government institutions that uh, have a policy on sexual harassment, not assault, but harassment. So um, uh, really people, let's, let's engage, put, post in your questions, uh, ask the questions online and uh, it, it, it will shape uh, our health uh, industry much better and make it uh, uh, more productive. Uh, so Bonface, uh, your parting shot. Mr. Bonface, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Amina, Dr. Merubeth. I, I apologize, I keep on having a disconnection, but I followed the Dr. Hello. Yes, I've I've been following uh, the the discussion, Dr. Mary Beth's uh, uh, comments. Uh, I want to start with the uh, cholera. Yes, we agree that cholera is becoming almost endemic in the country, and there is need to raise awareness among the healthcare workers and the community. And uh, we are going to discuss with the training team, uh, Caro Maina, who is in charge of the training team. Uh, to see how we can use this same platform to share more information on, on cholera. Uh, number two, I see um, there's a lot of interest uh, from uh, participants in on, on how to join the rapid response teams. I think uh, with your permission, Dr. Amina, I can share my email address or for members to share with me their details their CADA, their qualifications, and their skill set, so that we, uh, you know, onboard them into the national uh, rapid response teams. Yeah, kindly, kindly share before the session ends, so that we can, they can, they can jot it down. Okay, um, I'm typing it as as I continue. Uh, mine will be to thank uh, the organizers and the participants for this uh, wonderful uh, forum. Uh, I wish we that we can have more of this because uh, this becomes now a very effective way to share information and learn from each other. And uh, given another opportunity, I'll be very willing to come and uh, share with, with us. So thank you so much and uh, uh, a Merry Christmas to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Bonface. I'll be one of the people uh, jotting down your email to look for you for another presentation on a light note. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for your, your sharing your knowledge, sharing your information. Uh, we don't take it for granted and uh, we do hope and uh, we continue and uh, build our nation better from such uh, discussions. So as usual, thank you everybody for, for joining in, for listening in and for engaging. Uh, tomorrow, as Dr. Maritim has said, it's a rather exciting discussion uh, on risk communication and community engagement. Uh, please uh, log in and if you're unable, you'll be able to get it online. And um, thank you very much. As usual, you'll get this uh, recording on our KNH research uh, research YouTube channel. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to give us feedback. We do appreciate even uh, constructive criticism from, from, from the audience. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.